Whenever we talk about this concept of prediction, uh, this moves us into discussing what we call the neural hierarchy. And you can see, um, basically, at the beginning stages of all this, we just talk about three major systems. Uh, and the way that we describe this to clients is we will usually use the concept of GPS. So everyone's familiar with GPS at this point. Years ago, you know, you had the unit that sat on the, on the, <laughs> the dashboard of your car or whatever. Uh, and I usually will ask people, do you know how GPS works? And most people go, well, kind of, you know, there's a computer and it talks to a satellite and it tells me where we are. Well, it doesn't work just with one. Um, the way GPS typically works is we need a minimum of three satellites for the central computer to be able to access in order to, tri to triangulate uh, our actual position. Most modern GPS actually use more than three satellites, uh, but we need a minimum of three to know where we are. So we find this to be a great analogy for how the human body functions. So for us, the kind of central computer, the actual GPS unit in the human body would be the brain. And when we think about the three satellite systems, we're gonna talk about the visual, the vestibular, and the proprioceptive. Now, the reason that this is listed out and looks this way <clears throat> is that when we talk about the hierarchy, we give weighting uh, to different systems. So if you remember in the visual section, we talked about the idea that for primates, from, for humans, the visual system is the dominant sensory system. Uh, more areas of the neocortex are devoted to processing visual signals than anything else. And so in the hierarchy, we tend to consider the visual system as priority number one. From there, we next have the vestibular system. The vestibular system obviously is, as, I, as we're gonna discuss in a minute, and as I mentioned previously, it's the inner ear, has five sensors per side, and it has an enormous impact on multiple functional systems. Um, it's going to allow us to really locate ourselves in space. And then finally, we have the proprioceptive system. Now, why this is super important for us, at, even at the essentials level, to convey is that most of our classical education is around improving the proprioceptive system. And I keep mentioning this, right? We work on movement and we do a lot of mechanoreceptive based uh, work uh, as we you know, mobilize people, we have them move, we tape, we ice, etc. That's great. But what you need to understand is that in the hierarchy, the proprioceptive system will almost always be the system that is forced to adapt to problems that are occurring higher in the hierarchy. So as an example, uh, when I first was, uh, I mentioned this in one of the earlier sections, my first experience with the client with chronic neck pain, changing her glasses and her neck pain going away. So think about clients that you have, and if I, I usually do this whenever we have group classes, everyone is in here, I say, hey, I want everyone to assume the posture of your typical client. And usually about 70% of the class will go, Whoa. Right? And they go into that anterior head carriage, thoracic hyperkyphosis, rounded shoulder position that so many of us adopt over time sitting at the computer, etc. So at that point, we then start to talk about that. Because if someone comes to you and they have anterior head carriage, they're hyperkyphotic, and if we only use a proprioceptive approach without ever evaluating their visual system, their vestibular system, we're probably going to struggle to make any type of long-term change because the proprioceptive system usually is the system that pays the price for higher order deficits. So if I have someone that's sitting at a computer eight to 10 hours a day and they have visual deficits, as their eyes are fresh in the morning, hopefully they slept well, they woke, well, they wake up, they will have a maybe reasonable level of acuity, right? So if we go back to the Snellen chart, maybe they're 20, 20 at 7 a.m. when they wake up. If you test people throughout the day, probably by nine or 10, they will have moved from 2020 to maybe 2025, maybe in one eye. So now I have maybe 2020 in my right eye, 2025 or 2030 in my left eye. So this eye is getting a little more blurry. So now my ability to move my eyes around on the screen, focus on what I'm seeing uh, and understand it is beginning to be, is becoming more difficult because now I have a kind of blurry camera lens and a clear camera lens. So at that point, what we may see is a slight rotation of the cervical spine to bring the better eye uh, closer to what, you're tr what the client's trying to see on the screen. Now we test them maybe at two o'clock <laughs> and their eyes are getting really tired, really fatigued because they've been on the computer all day. So now maybe they're 20, 
40 in the left eye, 20, 30 in the right eye. So their acuity is getting worse <clears throat> because they're developing visual fatigue. So now head turning is not solving the problem. So now they're going to begin moving the head closer to the screen, adjusting the lighting conditions, etc., all in an effort to use their dominant sense in the way that they need to. <clears throat> that person then shows up for, for training or they show up in your therapy uh, clinic or wherever. And what are they complaining about? And they're like, well, my shoulders are killing me all the time. I have neck pain. And as you see them, they have a little bit of an anterior head carriage. Maybe they have a little rotation and a head tilt. The proprioceptive approach would be to go in and start palpating the trapezius and the paraspinals and maybe testing deep neck flexors, mobilizing the cervical spine, giving them a lot of mobility drills. And all of that may be beneficial. It may help their pain. It may help their muscle tension. But what it may never do is solve the problem because we have ignored the higher order deficit. So when we talk about all this stuff, as I said, the goal here is for you to leave this particular course with a broadened view of the multiple systems involved in high quality movement so that you can assess and train your clients more efficiently. So three systems we have for prediction. Obviously, as I said, we have the visual, vestibular, and proprioceptive. This is the hierarchy, and we would prefer for you to learn it in this order. There are times when we will say maybe it switches a little bit based off an of individual uh, presentation, but for us, it's really important that you learn it in this order. All right, so whenever we talk about this, we're gonna stout, now start using a term called sensory matching. Because in order for us to move efficiently through the world, we need our brain to receive information from the, our three major uh, satellite systems. And there are a couple of requirements for all this to work well. So number one, we need clear information from all three systems. So I need my visual system to give me similar information to my vestibular system, and I need those two systems to match up with what I'm feeling proprioceptively, all right? So I need clear information from the three systems. This is where it gets really interesting because again, we have two eyes. We have two sets of um, vestibular organs. Uh, we have obviously a huge number of muscles and joints and et cetera. So the idea of having clear information from all three systems means that as a movement coach, I need to be able to test each system and each side of the system independently. I need to also make sure that they are working together. And then I need to make sure that they're integrating with the other systems. So over time, I have to test the right eye, I have to test the left eye, make sure that the left eye and right eye are working well independently and then working together. I have to test the, test the right vestibular system, left vestibular system, and make sure that they are talking to one another well and integrating and saying the same thing. And then I have to look at the right side of the body, the left side of the body, the midline, the right side and left side of the body, make sure that those are functioning well and that those are also integrating with what we're receiving from the visual and vestibular systems. So accurate prediction is honestly a miracle, right? At some level, the fact that we can move well through the world with all these different things going on, I think is one of the coolest things. But it also means that there are a lot of possible areas for things to go wrong that we need to be able to test, all right? So we need clear information from our three, th three satellite systems. That's number one. And then number two, we now have to remember that the brain needs to be able to integrate that information appropriately as well. So it's not enough to just test the eyes. We have to make sure that the brain knows what the eyes are saying. It's not enough to test the vestibular system or proprioceptive system. We have to make sure that the brain is healthy enough to integrate that information, make a decision about it, and then create an appropriate motor output. All of this is tied up into the assessments and, and exercises, et cetera, that we teach throughout the curriculum. But well, we wanna make sure that you understand this particular concept because it helps shape everything that you're gonna do with a client. Safety begins with accurate prediction. Accurate prediction comes from clear information from our major neural hierarchical systems and the ability of the brain to uh, correctly integrate that information. So it starts to show you why there are so many different areas of uh, applied neuroscience that are so interesting and are often so effective in creating change. Now, 
When we have problems with sensory matching, we just call it sensory mismatch. So now instead of having our satellites, we've got a, uh, you know, we're in Vegas here, so, so we have a slot machine that's gone badly wrong, right? We didn't win anything on this one. So now all of a sudden, uh, I'm getting aberrant information from one of the systems or all the systems, or my brain's not integrating the information correctly, or all of that's going on. So let's say I have a visual problem, I have a vestibular problem, I have proprioceptive problems, and I've had a brain injury, which makes integration difficult. We call this process of inappropriate information uh, or inappropriate integration from each of the systems coming into the brain, sensory mismatch. The most common um, example of sensory mismatch that everyone is familiar with at some level is motion sickness. So what is motion sickness, right? You're riding in the car, you're on a boat, and what's happening is your visual system is receiving one type of information, your vestibular system is receiving a different type of information, and because the brain is experiencing this mismatch, you get symptoms, right? The brain wants you to stop uh, what's going on wants to you to change behavior. So then it will typically enact one of its most useful tools for getting you out of a moving um, you know, object, which is nausea and vomiting. Uh, so right, you're, in, you're on a boat, maybe you've uh, not been on a boat and you go down, you're sitting in the cabin and you're getting the vestibular sensation of movement, right? The boat's going up and down, it's rocking side to side, but maybe you're sitting there reading. And because your brain's so good at stabilizing your eyes, it feels like you're not moving visually, but your vestibular system is getting this constant sense of up and down and side to side motion. And if that goes on long enough, all of a sudden your brain says, wait, I'm not sure what's actually happening. I'm getting different information from my eyes. Uh, as I compare it to my vestibular system, I don't like this. I want you to stop. I need you to get off this boat or at least need you to stop reading and the motion sickness starts to occur. So that's a kind of classic example of sensory mismatch. Uh, another example that we often will talk about, if, if, if you come from a, a biomechanical background, obviously people have been talking about fascia for 15 or 20 years. And if you've done a lot of hands-on work with people, you'll find examples or you, you will have seen or felt people that feel twisted, right? They feel rotated. They have um, uh, thoracic rotation, cervical rotations. Once again, this is kind of a classic example often of sensory mismatch. So um, we were talking earlier about this example of a client that comes in, they work in a computer all day, and they have a very different um, level of acuity in each eye. So let's, let's take that to kind of to its logical conclusion so you can understand what we're talking about with sensory mismatch and how the proprioceptive system may pay the price. So let's say you have a client that comes in, they're 45 years old, and we're going to imagine that their eyes are even, even worse than we thought, all right? So they have maybe 20-50 vision in the left eye and 20-20 vision in the right eye, meaning the right eye is nice and clear, the left eye is not very good. The typical instinctual response to this is to use the better visual side to explore or work in the environment. So if my right eye is my dominant eye, usually what will happen, dominant eye and, sorry, more acute, um, eye with more acuity, we will typically see people do this. They will actually rotate the head to bring the better eye toward the midline of the body because it will allow them to both use foveal vision and access more peripheral vision. So we have a little bit of a left head rotation to bring that right eye to the midline, okay? So that's number one. Now let's add a vestibular problem to that, all right? Say that again, we're gonna add a vestibular problem to that. So let's imagine that this person, maybe they fell and hit their head a couple of years ago. It was mild, they were dizzy for a couple of days, but thought nothing of it, really, they were checked out. Uh, and now they have a underlying low-grade vestibular problem. We haven't talked about the vestibular system a lot uh, yet, but we're going to, but what I want you to know right now is that we have these different canals in the inner ear, and some of those canals are dedicated to telling the brain if I'm turning my head right or turning my head left, all right? In other words, they're going to handle horizontal movements. So now, let's say we've got this person, they have this right head rotation, um, and let's say their vestibular injury uh, has altered the firing rates and firing patterns in their inner ear, and the altered firing rates are actually indicating to the brain that their head is turning right. So now we have 
a left head rotation to bring my dominant eye online, but now my inner ear is actually telling me that I am turning my head right. And this is a, this is a common issue, all right? So I now have competitive stimuli occurring. I have a visual stimulus that's saying, I want you to keep your head turned left. I have a vestibular stimulus that's telling me I'm constantly turning my head right. So now I have a tug of war going on between the visual and vestibular systems. Guess who's gonna pay the price? The proprioceptive system. Imagine the amount of tension that's going to build up as a result of that sensory mismatch. I will have ongoing neck, shoulder, thoracic, full body tension actually, and if that goes on for years, the proprioceptive system will do its best to adjust for those tensions and start to alter fascial tensions and even fascial structures over time. So sensory mismatch is not just a, hey, temporary, I got car sick. It can have long-term ramifications on the musculoskeletal system. Other examples uh, where we see sensory mismatch uh, in at least the literature, scoliosis, a high number of patients with scoliosis also have um, on testing significant vestibular disorders. It's not completely consistent. We cannot say 100% of people with scoliosis have detectable uh, vestibular disorders, but it is a relatively high percentage uh, depending on what age groups you look at. Uh, sensory mismatch, obviously we've been talking about pain throughout. So you would expect that to be a potential ramification of the mismatch. Neurobehavioral disorders, another interesting side of all of this. And remember, when, when we talk about research, um, sometimes we can, we can correlate findings. We, we can't say definitively if X causes Y, but we can see that they're associated. There is a lot of research looking at sensory mismatch, so visual, vestibular, uh, and proprioceptive mismatch in uh, both children and adults with neurobehavioral disorders. So things like uh, ADHD. That is a fairly common group in which you will find sensory mismatch. Um, that's just kind of one example. We find also after traumatic brain injury, people that suffer a lot of anxiety um, or even moving into depressive episodes, when we test them, we will very often find mismatch between the visual and vestibular systems. Movement disturbances, obviously you would anticipate that. What I can tell you is if you think through your client list right now, think about the people you're going to see this week. Maybe it's going to be 30 people, maybe it's going to be 100. I don't know what your practice is. But if you were to sit and look at the list of people that you have coming, I can almost guarantee you that you have 20% that if you had to rate their movement quality, you have 20% of them that you would put at the bottom, <laughs> right? Where they're like, I don't know what's going on with this person. I've been working with them for a while and they just don't move well. If you take that group of your worst 20% of movers in your particular practice and you test them, go through the visual testing, go through the vestibular testing that we're going to be going through shortly, I guarantee you you're going to find a lot of higher order deficits uh, that are probably indicative of a sensory mismatch, which is making movement harder for them. Remember, it all comes back to prediction. I need my eyes, my ears, my body to all see, the same, uh, see and experience the world the same way. When I, they are not experiencing the world the same way, I get mismatch and the brain puts the brakes on. It, it creates these protective outputs uh, to try to make me move less and hopefully uh, move with less chance of injury. So these are, again, just some of the things that you will see. You can go on Google Scholar, type in sensory mismatch, and you will see lots and lots of papers pop up. Uh, this is a concept that's being explored in more and more um, arenas. And uh, we've been looking at it this way for about two decades. So I would really encourage you to start to think about every client that you see, whatever problem they have, what potential mismatches could be occurring that would cause that.